so let me let me just tell you guys i'm i'm going to be chairing this session um and uh so if you if you need to ask any questions please go in the q a type them in i will look at them eventually and ask uh, to the rest of uh, of the team um so I'll, I'll start sharing my screen and sharing the very first presentation, which is my introductory. So hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Marco Cerato, I'm the um, SVP for Global Corporate and Business Development at Mundi Pharma. And uh, today, uh, myself and a group of uh, highly skilled people We'll be talking about the strategies across the life cycle of, of biosimilars. So here you see an egg. Okay, that's 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 not a dragon egg. That's actually a monarch butterfly egg under the electronic microscope. Let's say that's our biosimilar in embryonal phases when it's being developed and it's uh, uh, before it starts selling it actually in the market. We don't know what's going to be, but uh, we have it there. And then that becomes a beautiful caterpillar. But, you know, the caterpillar is not a butterfly yet, so it's what you would call a question mark in the BCG um, uh, quadrant. And, uh, and as, a, as a question mark, you still don't know if there's going to be a, a bird coming by and, uh, and eat it up or if it's going to evolve in something else. With biosimilars, uh, you, you will not know the performance of the biosimilar until you are in a competitive environment in the market. And generally what you can say is that if you are within a first wave, which I would uh, um, consider or um, define as launch within the first three to four months from the first biosimilar launch, um, then your life will be much more difficult. Uh, but if you are in the first wave, you most probably will become a beautiful pink butterfly. Now, the, the, the pink butterfly was chosen by my daughter and I could not change it ever since. So. Um, but at that point, you have a star. You have an asset that actually generates value. It's within uh, potentially, hopefully, in a portfolio of products, and uh, and, uh, and and that will be in the in the star of the BCG. Now, unfortunately, uh, all all, uh, all beings come to an end, and uh, they they do die. Um, in the case of biosimilars, in the case of pharma, let's say we don't we don't like assets to die. We, we really like to keep them for the long term like cash cows. We like what we can call the walking dead. We don't put any effort in it, are practically almost dead, but they do generate value for us. And um, so we, we still keep them going. Uh, we don't uh, dedicate too much time to them, but they generate uh, value. In the case of biosimilars, unfortunately, the value generated in the tail asset is smaller compared to other uh, originated products because uh, the margins get slimmer and slimmer with, uh, with time. Now, before going into a little bit of what the, um, uh, the life cycle of a biosimilar is, I wanted to introduce you briefly to what is the perfect competition, the concept of perfect competition. Actually, you might already know, uh, but co perfect competition happens when buyers have full information. In the case of biosimilar, despite the fact that you started selling biosimilar when there wasn't full information, there were barriers to use, the uh, doctors were skeptical about them. The MOH, the, uh, they, they just uh, didn't feel like using uh, biosimilars, but uh, somehow the people that had uh, the capability, the companies had capability to convince uh, the, Ministry, the Ministry of Health and, and the insurances and the, and the reimbursement uh, uh, agencies were the ones that were successful. Right now, it's much more toward having a full information. You need to have in perfect competition similar products, and this one is a big one, you know, you know, using selling biosimilars. You need to have equal market share. Now, this is perfect competition. We're not there yet, but with time in bias in the biosimilar space, you're actually going toward equal market share in a way. You see that if the assets have been launched more or less at the same time, uh, it, it, the market share is not starkly different. It's another, it, it's it could because these assets are becoming more and more generic in a way in, in the biosimilar space. 
you also have many competing firms. Competing firms are increasing. We're not there yet with a, you know, too many of them uh, yet because certain barriers to entry are still there and barriers to exit are still uh, there. So we cannot really talk about complete perfect competition, but we're getting close to it. Why? Uh, because if you, if you think about the barriers to entry that we have right now, we have CapEx, intensive CapEx that needs to be put in place in order to develop these products as well as uh, once, in, once in market, you or before, sorry, to get into market, you have to run quite expensive long clinical trials. Not as expensive or, or as long as the one of the originator, but still quite an investment. You will be accumulating 50 to 100 million in investments in a biosimilar before actually seeing it in the market and being launched in the market. So there is still quite a bit of a, of a barrier there. But with time and the trends tell us that uh, what we're trying to do in any case as an industry is also to, to try to avoid those kind of phase three trials. And if we can, uh, we will go toward a bioidentical uh, kind of concept where you don't really need to do the old phase three trial because the product is fundamentally the same as the originator. So now let's look at the life cycle of, of, of these assets how to manage the life cycle. And consider this as a little bit of a, an introduction to what uh, the rest of, of the team here, the rest of, uh, of my colleagues will be explaining to you in the different parts of their presentations. So you see here, what would be the usual suspect? An asset originated product being launched, reaching pretty much the peak sales in about four years in Europe, then stabilizing and finally uh, dying under the pressure of generics entering the market or biosimilars entering the market at a patent cliff point. Now, this is very different from, let's say, our biosimilar sticky, uh, sticky notes map. So the biosimilar has a kind of a different uh, life cycle. You start off and you have a quite a quick uptake. You usually get to uh, peak, uh, peak share in two to three years. So it's uh, quite, quite quicker than, than other assets. You're not really um, promoting the asset, but rather substituting the asset. Um, you're, 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 of course, you need to be careful about the retail versus the, the tenant business. But the idea is that you will have quite a peak right away. And then you have a tail, but the tail goes down quite fast, unfortunately. And the pricing is, is, is squished. So you got to have a somewhat of a verticalization. You got to have somewhat of a control of cost in order to use that lever and, and stay in business. So how do you really manage uh, the uh, a portfolio or, a, or of the life cycle or the life cycle of, of biosimilar? Well, you, you should create a portfolio. The kind of effect that you see, the additive effect that you see in a portfolio of biosimilars, it's pretty much what you see in here. So you will see that once, once you add one biosimilar every one to two years, or two to two years to your portfolio, uh, depending on, of course, when these biologics uh, uh, go off patent, you will build up value. And by building up value, you're also creating, of course, uh, profitability. Um, but what happens when you stop adding product? Well, you go quickly down to, 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 uh, into a downward spiral. So if you want to look, and I, I hope this is a, a helpful kind of graphic, if you want to look at the partnering model where you cherry pick the asset and you don't have a big expense in terms of capex, you don't verticalize, you actually work on a partner by partner basis. Well, in that case, um, your cost, including the cost of the goods that you're buying or the margin share that you're, you're, you're sharing with the third party, plus the cost of your platform, let's say this is a, a case of a European platform, will be following more or less that red line. For the first couple of years, you will be under or slightly making maybe some marginality, but very, very little. Then once it gets to the third year, you start adding additional product, you start generating a profitability, maybe a 10% profitability. Now, when you go on and you keep on adding assets, you can go up to about 20, 25, 30% EBITDA with these assets in a portfolio environment because your cost of platform, your basic cost actually remains pretty much stable. Um, of course, if you stop adding assets, you see that tail. You see that, that what happens there with uh, uh, your, your profitability actually reducing to the point where you're actually going under. 
Now, one last example here, or a last graphic, is about what would be a fully verticalized company total platform cost be, where you don't have, a, so this is the case where you have a, a joint venture with a third party, or you have a platform agreement, which is very, uh, very much a synergistic kind of, of agreement with, with a third party that manages more than one product and, and also works with you toward a reduction of cost. Or you are a Sandus and you have a, you are fully verticalized completely. You have your 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 capabilities internally. You have the production. You 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 sunk your cost in terms of capex. In those cases, well, it becomes a much more profitable kind of business. So uh, what I highly suggest is that, and again, this is look, looking at the market and the evolution of the market, is that companies at this point, if they want to enter, although there are still quite quite important barrier, they should have control of all the uh, value chain, one way or another. So um, this pretty much concludes my, my introduction, but I just want to introduce to you the, uh, these, these bunch of guys that is on the call with me. So uh, we'll have first, uh, right after me, Neil Okay, is the general manager of Adalvo and the chief commercial officer of Alvotech. He will be talking about uh, defense mechanism across the life of the of the biosimilars versus originators, as well as what would be a portfolio approach, pretty much what I, what I showed uh, previously. Then we have uh, Gopal. Gopal is the Deputy General Manager in Global Business Development uh, in uh, the biotech division of Lupin. He'll be focusing on early on in the life cycle of, of uh, biosimilars by explaining what market entry strategies uh, could be there, as well as how to integrate a business unit to run by similar with the rest of, of your company. Then we're going to Wen. Um, she is the VP for Europe and general manager of TechDAO Pharma Shenzhen, part of the Epeling Pharmaceutical Group. And she will be talking about uh, owning the value chain. So importance of securing supply, as well as uh, some mixed approaches to uh, generate value in, the, in different parts of, of the world in different territories. And finally, we have uh, Jean-Baptiste, Jean-Baptiste Duval is the head of international operation in Shanghai Indus Biotech. He'll be talking about pricing, he'll be talking about the market dynamics during the life of, of biosimilar, and including uh, the trend towards somewhat of a generalization of, of uh, biosimilars. So now, because I knew this is a session right after lunch, I had to put something that could wake you up, uh, especially after my presentation. So here you go. <laughs> First of all, uh, thanks for all the participants for their valuable time today with us. And it's also a great pleasure to be with Pharma Synergy again. Thanks a lot for Jane and Christina for inviting. And Marco, great to share the venue again with you. Uh, so as, as, as Marco mentioned, uh, my topic is a uh, slightly an interesting topic it's also linked with life cycle management but also how to retain value as much as possible in biosimilars in the market so uh, with that i just kick off my presentation uh, for the ones who doesn't know the album family companies i just wanted to put this one pager uh, to remind ourselves but probably almost everybody is aware of it so it's it's part of the Alvogen Alvogen family companies and Alvotech is the biotechnology arm of the group uh, which is a fully vertically integrated biosimilars development company. We do not uh, develop innovative stuff. We just fo focus on biosimilars, which we believe is critically important for the long term. And you see also some of our uh, branded business units in the US on the right side, injectable business, as well as the 505B2 business. Today, uh, I will be, of course, focusing on biosimilars part of it, where I'm heading the commercial for Albotech. If we go to a little bit of a really different different perspective in, into the biosimilars, it's, we talk a lot about the cost of goods, we talk a lot about the platform, we talk a lot about the vertical integration, we talked a lot about portfolio uh, approach, which are all true facts. But what is also very uh, obviously happening in the biosimilars field, the defense strategies of the innovators, I don't know if we talk about them enough in our industry, but there are really few things that I just listed and there are more than stuff like that. 
in the market. But I thought these are the most really critically important one for the long-term success of biosimilars in the market, especially during their life cycle. So one of them is the improved formulations coming from the innovator pharma. I mean, you know the Humira story, right? Uh, $24 billion product. And one day you wake up in Europe as a patient and you have a new product in your hand, which is called citrate-free uh, formulation. And what's happening the next day, I'll be stop supplying the old product and you have a new product, uh, which, is a, which is a barrier for the biosimilar developers, right? That has happened in Europe. And we see this happening in, in several other big bio biologics as well. Then uh, combination products, the, the, the folks who are in the small molecules business are very familiar with this fixed dose combination setup, which is a big, big buzz nowadays under the value added medicines segment. We started to see this in the biologics. Uh, there are now fixed dose combination biological products. And the question is that how the biosimilars will be able to compete with those things. And then as Marco rightfully mentioned, one phase three for a biosimilar is costing anywhere from $40 million to $60 million on a global scale. And then on a combination product, you might need to look into a different expense profile, which is going to be a high barrier for, for biosimilar companies. So this is what is also called another defense strategy. Of course, they are increasing the patient value. Of course, they are bringing something innovative to the market. But in the long term, they are also causing additional burden to the society and to the budget of the authorities. And then uh, we see a lot of biological products with the drug device combinations. Again, the folks from the small molecules will remember how the companies are struggled so, so many years with the drug device device combinations. I mean, if you look into the respiratory segment, there are still so many products which have not hit to the market in the respiratory segment because of the drug device combination and the complexity around it. This is what's happening with biologics. We see more than half of the upcoming biological portfolios are coming with the drug device combination. So the question is that is a biosimilar developer ready for handling uh, devices or handling different uh, formulation types? These are all really the created defense strategies by the, by the big pharma. And you are all familiar, the litigations in the US, this is more like a US topic. Uh, we all know, for instance, uh, Humira again is a prime example, which is enjoying 25 plus years of exclusivity. And then uh, you have Embrad, which is as of today, if the litigation with Sando do not go through, they are enjoying 30 years of exclusivity. And that's another defense strategy. So. So that's also creating a long-term issue for the biosimilar developers and that needs to be very cleverly designed by the biosimilar companies and there are ways to do it there are ways to circumvent there are ways to to fight but what i'm trying to say it's an important uh, life cycle management strategy for the companies and also uh, very similar in the small molecules we have been seeing new strengths uh, we have been seeing the products are being shifted the new strand or to the upcoming product. And this is what is happening very common with biological products, especially in the oncology segment. Uh, the guidelines are changing, the dosings are changing, combination products are coming, clinical uh, database is extremely intense with the oncological pro products. And the question is that how the biosimilars can really cope up with all this dynamic environment where the big pharma is pumping hundreds of hundreds billion dollars to their R&D in, in that space. So uh, these are really important defense strategies. And I think any biosimilar developer uh, already from the product selection phase should look into all of these criteria very carefully and should bet their uh, asset selection with, with very careful, careful mindset. And uh, if we go to a little bit of the another angle, so I want to really change your perspective uh, in this case, looking into different angles. So we looked into the case how the big pharma is defending their position. And now I would like to uh, show to the biosimilar developers how we can differentiate ourselves versus big pharma and versus our biosimilar competitors. There are also ways to do that, even though biologicals are biologicals, meaning they are complex and they are difficult to mix, still there are ways to differentiate. So let me start with the point one interchangeability. 
in the US, as you know, there is a guideline how to make interchangeable biosimilar. And as of today, how many companies are using this, this guideline? Three? That's an interesting, interesting fact, right? Then the question is that what are the more than 30 plus biosimilar developers are doing? Are they sleeping? Or are they just hoping that this will go away? This will not go away in the short period of time. This will stay there for a couple of years. Maybe uh, in the long term, it might go away. But we know this from the small molecules. It's the same thing, AB rating, right? We call it AB rating in small molecules. In the biologics, they call it interchangeability. It's the same thing. Uh, but I don't see many biosimilar companies are following this path, which is, I, I think, is a big shame for the industry because it's going to hit the uptake. It will hit the uh, penetration into the market. And more importantly, it will hit the society and, and the patients, which will not have access to the biosimilars. So this has to be really carefully considered by uh, biosimilar developers. This is an additional commitment. This is an additional investment. And biosimilar companies should carefully assess if it makes sense to do that. And if so, they should really make a careful business case. And the second thing is that uh, Innovator Pharma, of course, coming with a device platform. But if you look into them, to be honest, they are, of course, just licensing in uh, the devices which are commercially available in the market. There are a few companies which are coming with an innovative device. So the question is then how biosimilar companies can come up with better devices which cre creates better patient compliance. There are really good examples in the market for uh, device platforms. And even with the dig digitalization right now, uh, with, with your phone connected with your device, there are amazing technologies which is basically reminding to the patient when to take the next injection, uh, which can be a big topic. For, for, for insulins, which can be a big topic for all other mobs where you need to use it sometime on a quarterly basis. And are you going to uh, really find the exact time to inject your product? So all of this uh, innovation is available for the biosimilar companies. But again, unfortunately, we don't see this innovation so much in the biosimilar companies. Uh, the third point is that presentations, meaning the SKUs, of course, Mark already mentioned biosimilar development is an expensive thing. But on the other side, developing an additional presentation, how much does it cost? Additional 5%, let's say 10%. I think the biosimilar companies should really make the calculation if it makes sense to have the full presentations and, and have some presentations which their competitors will not have. And all of these uh, simple but powerful uh, differentiations make the impact into the marketplace. And we have seen that very carefully all the biosimilar launches in Europe or in the US uh, have been successful thanks to some of these differentiations and we have to really carefully consider them. And the last but not least, uh, which is not a space, which is not a domain that uh, my company is operating, but of course, biobetters uh, are a big, big topic, especially the companies in Asia successfully applying these concepts here in Europe it is not paid, we all know that. But beyond that, we also know innovators have their chronic problems as well, right? Uh, their products are not crystal clear, their products are not perfect. They are continuously improving their products. So the question is that can biosimilars fix some of the technical issues that the innovator products have and come up with a bio better? Uh, which is really interesting concept. And I think there are a few companies which are really getting specialized in that. And I believe that this is going to be a really big differentiation moving forward in the biosimilars industry. So with my presentation, I really wanted to uh, show you two different angles. The one of them is how the innovator pharma is defending their biological products. And secondly, how biosimilars can try to differentiate themselves versus innovators versus uh, their peer competitors. And with that, I just hand over back to Marco. Thank you, thank you, Anil. And it's uh, I think that the, the the angle of how the originators are are trying to avoid the biosimilars entering into the market is a is a very interesting angle, as well as how they are trying to defend their assets and uh, moving from one uh, formulation to the other. And that uh, we've seen that happening uh, a lot with with generics uh, before the biosimilars. So, uh, it, but it's not. Uh, it's not explored enough. So th thank you for, for uh, 
uh, explaining a little bit to us and uh, and uh, just tickling our 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 uh, curiosity about that. So now next uh, it's uh, Gopal. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Anil. I think that was a very good, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you know, getting into this discussion and. Uh, uh, today, uh, my name is Gopal. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's in different parts of the world. Uh, and today, I'm going to just briefly talk about some of the market entry strategies of uh, what Lupin is employing and also give you a little bit of the India perspective of where the overall uh, field is heading towards. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start off by giving a very uh, the positive outlook about the overall biosimilar market and where it's expected to go. Uh, you know, 35 billion by 2025, it's everybody is having their eyes, uh, especially the people in the biosimilar business. Uh, in India as well, I think, uh, you know, the early story started off in 2004, I would say, and in 2004 to about 20 years now, uh, the markets come a long way. The understanding has come a long way and also the technology, the barriers in terms of manufacturing have all been overcome. And I think there's a handful of companies that are very well established within India uh, that will take this to the next level. But in terms of the overall performances, I just wanted to spend a couple of slides on how the US is going, as well as how the uh, Europe and Japan market is going, because these are three of the key markets for Lupin. And uh, just to show you in, in the past five years, the number of approvals and launches that have happened on biosimilars, of course, last year, 2020 being the outlier in this case, but there's clearly a clear trend of approvals happening over the past uh, years in the US. Of course, Europe is way ahead. Uh, in terms of the overall uh, uptake of biosimilars as well, this is just one example from a PBM which is uh, shown here, and this is for, uh, you know, biosimilar trastuzumab and uh, biosimilar bevacizumab and trastuzumab combination. And you can see just one PBM pushing the envelope up to almost 90% of biosimilar usage uh, just shows that how, how much of the understanding is really improved in the US from not knowing what biosimilars were to uh, having a lot of fear about biosimilars to actually benefiting the patients, which is the overall theme that you know, we, we all want to try and explain to these uh, people on this call that the overall theme is to make sure that the patients benefit. And that's why we are in this business. In terms of the therapeutics, as well as the uptake, very clearly you can see the, the approval dates as well as the number of biosimilars in the US and also the volume share. And this is a big, big, uh, focus point for all the people in the biosimilar business, where you can clearly make out that some of these key molecules are, you know, taking a very good market share uh, in, in less than maybe four to five years uh, with, you know, filgrastim product like uh, peg filgrastim and filgrastim going up to 52 to 25, 28%. And also the oncology medicines going up to 40% which is uh, a very, very interesting uh, number, especially from uh, you know, a, a company perspective as well. Again, uh, just some IMS numbers to show you how Japan and EU are, are running in some of the key molecules that we have in our pipeline. And you will see that you know, the, the biosimilar uptake has been very, very uh, strong and almost vertical in some of the cases of some molecules. And even in Japan, which is traditionally a, a more conservative market when it comes to biosimilars, there has been a lot of uh, you know, uptake even talk even among that, that market. So this is actually gives you a very good picture of where the biosimilar industry is heading and companies which have been traditionally in the generic business uh, are looking up to, to uh, this business to make sure that, you know, this is the next wave of their development. Uh, you know, coming to Lupin, we are the eighth largest generic company by sales, third largest Indian pharma company, uh, third largest in the US by prescription, and way, various other markets where we have very good position in the market. This actually is a very good segue for us when we are entering into the biosimilar business. Traditionally in India, Lupin has entered the biosimilar business 
a little later than all its uh, peers or competitors, I would say. But this has not stopped us from getting approvals for some of our molecules. And, you know, uh, as a company, there is a very strong foundation with regards to uh, complex generics and speciality focus. And we are building a, building a very good portfolio around uh, nephrology, neurology, CNS, women's health, as well as biosimilars. And we are moving into new chemical entities. So, you know, this, this kind of leads us to making a very robust case for biosimilars in, within the organization. And one of the key aspects is the fact that we have a very well established direct to market business in the US already. Uh, stepping on to what Marco had earlier mentioned, I think it's very key to have a portfolio of biosimilars. Uh, one of the things that we have done is to make sure that all the biosimilars in the Lupin portfolio are ready for global markets right from the beginning. Uh, a lot of Indian companies, I would say, traditionally started off by developing the molecules for India, then learned as we went along, then launched it in emerging markets, and then again went and launched it, you know, redeveloped it or uh, did more clinical trials and went into the European and the US market and Japan market. In a way, this is a very good strategy in terms of getting a revenue stream and putting that money back into the business. But it also delays the process because it takes longer time to develop these molecules uh, while you're redoing it every time you enter into a more highly regulated market. Whereas in Lupin, what we have done is we, from the right, right, right from the beginning of development, we are always targeting the large US market and then we do one development, we spend all the money for doing a global clinical trial, and then that helps us to enter all the markets in the business in, in, that is available for the business. So we are currently having a portfolio that's looking at almost $33 billion. So even uh, with 10% of the $33 billion uh, for all the innovator molecules, even 10% is a lot of money uh, in when it comes to an organization like you. Uh, and with regards to the way uh, uh, of commercialization, just in terms of the overall uh, portfolio management, I think one of the key aspects that you know, we talk internally as well, and with a lot of people in the, in the market, is having some kind of direct to market presence in the US, EU, or Japan. And this really benefits uh, the investment that goes into the biosimilar business. Uh, as a US, uh, with regards to Lupin, uh, with US, we are very focused in the, uh, we are very in a very unique position because for an Indian company to be the third largest in prescription basis, we have a direct to market access from 2004. And I'll spend a little bit more on, on the US entry strategy in the next slide. With EU, we have already partnered with companies like Beatrice and also partnering with other companies for our market entry. And we also have direct to market uh, in, in UK, Germany, as well as Italy. So this is some of the markets that we, we are really focusing on and looking for uh, business partners in other markets to enter uh, in, in Europe. With Japan, it's a very clear strategy of a partnered approach. And we've already done well with our Eternacept molecule with almost 13% by market share by volume with just 18 months after launch. Uh, and then, of course, emerging markets. Currently, we have marketing subsidiary offices in over 20 countries. And in other markets, we are planning to go uh, with partnering approach. So this is a combination of you know, a direct to market and combination approach. And this has served well for us so far. And we are looking forward to capitalize on this as we go into the next stage of the evolution of Lupin Bio. And a little bit more on the US front and what are the advantages that we carry. I think our uh, uh, overarching principle with regards to how we are preparing for our launches in the US is the, fact, uh, is the fact that we have a very focused marketing strategy designed around key influencers and enablers. We are uh, having the experience of being a generic player. So we understand the pricing strategy in these markets and how to meet those pricing strategies. And of course, uh, with the very good science behind and the team behind us, we have a, we have a very good uh, uh, Cox leadership and that will help us uh, because of the India manufacturing base advantage that we carry. Uh, and how, uh, how are we looking to enter into the second wave, even though you know, we are not in the first wave, 
Uh, there's, there's been talk about this and a lot of people say in biosimilars being the second is actually more advantageous than the first. And to some extent, I really believe in this, but I think the, the main thing though is having creative alliances in markets where we are uh, going direct to market, trying to work with PBMs, OFC model, work with the Copays uh, model, uh, 340B pass-through model. And then of course, uh, the biggest advantage is the vertical integration that we have as an organization. Literally from while to while, we can make it in-house in India. And that makes us uh, really be very flexible with regards to the way the market proceeds and be ready for price cuts, price increase, be ready for uh, large volumes, which is also key. And I think in the biosimilar business, there are two main aspects. Uh, one is of course the, the price and the other is volume. And uh, being prepared for both of those is very, very important. Overall, I feel uh, the, the biosimilar business is like a boat that is just coming out of the Arctic Ocean and getting more into the open ocean. I think the, the, the hurdles, the difficulties that have been uh, you know, faced over the years uh, with, with, uh, with the innovators changing so many things over every, almost every year, we're trying to come up with new formulations, new presentations, I think today we've reached a stage where we are able to predict those, which I think Anil covered very beautifully and also Marco mentioned in, in the initial slides. And we are entering into the open waters. Uh, of course, this open waters means there's more competition. There's gonna be more price struggle. There's gonna be uh, uh, a more un, uh, you know, approvals that are coming through. And uh, in our, I think bottom line being the patients will definitely benefit. And the government will also benefit and more volume will be there will be seen uptake of these molecules and definitely there is going to be a huge price saving for, for patients as well as for the government but i think there's uh, you know uh, also uh, it's going to be becoming a volume game and a price sensitive market game uh, and you know this is uh, something that i really wanted to share with the team today and uh, also uh, share with the fact that I think today in India, the biosimilar business has come a long way. Uh, I think uh, during the COVID situation, everybody was mentioning that Lupin uh, or India is the pharmacy of the world, but I think we have also become the pharmacist supplying country of the world because nowadays we see people from India being employed all over the biosimilar and generic business and even novel molecule business. And that's a good sign, I think. But what is also done is the overall understanding of the manufacturing capabilities has also increased. The quality in India has also increased. And moving from a generic business to a biosimilar business has only paved the way for uh, Indian pharma companies to be a more active player in a lot more business as we go along. So with that, uh, you know, I hand it back to Marco uh, and. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Gopal. I, I think, I mean, thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned more than once, and it's so true, is that we're here for the patients. And, uh, and it's, I'm, uh, you know, I, I very much agree. And uh, you've, uh, you know, you You've, you've kept on mentioning it uh, more and more. And, um, and I was thinking about one of the statistics that I have asked uh, to my analytical team to look into uh, in order to understand how much Mundi Pharma had saved to the system, to the European system uh, um, in, the, in the first, I think, three years of, of uh, biosimilars, three, four years of biosimilars launched in the market. And the figure, just considering the bits that Mundi Pharma did, was a one billion one billion euros in savings for the for the European uh, for these European countries and how can those money be used? They can be reinvested in innovation. They can be uh, reinvested in innovation for rare diseases as well as for, for future diseases of patients. So you're actually creating a little bit of an environment where environment where you increase uh, the accessibility of these assets. So you have a, a wider set of patients that have this product and they can benefit from from these assets these products but on top of that you're also releasing 
uh, value, re releasing capital that can be used in other settings to fund uh, additional research. So it's, 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 I think it's a, a very important. And uh, another couple of uh, very positive messages that you showed, you started off showing uh, the market is increasing and more and more these biosimilars are, are actually ga gaining uh, market share and, and faster than, than ever. Um, and that's also a, a very important message. And, and finally, I think that it came across your presentation, you've been humble enough to understand that partnering is important. And in countries such as Japan, or I guess China, or some other countries around the world where you don't have the capabilities or the structure to, to be a, an important player, you end it over to a third party uh, partner to, to, to generate value for, for you and for, for the patients. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Marco. We are proceeding with uh, when? Oh, thank you very much for everybody and uh, nice to meeting you all and uh, like good afternoon, good morning or good evening, wherever you're based. So uh, my presentation today is uh, following, I mean, Gupal's is more like a Chinese company's journey in Europe. So that's my presentation and which is linked to this Pharma Synergy event on the biosimilar is in fact, our product is a biosimilar product. Okay, so, so my company is Tecto Pharma, in fact, it belongs to the Hyperlink Group. And the Hyperlink Group originally is a purely uh, API business, hampering API business. So it, this, the API legacy of this company dated back in 1984. And the, the company started the API business of Hapring. And in the 2000, uh, I don't know how many uh, of you remember that uh, in the 2008, uh, there is an uh, Baxter um, contamination of, uh, you know, the, the, the Hapring uh, API. So they caused a lot of allergy, even some 23 uh, deaths in the US market. And that time, you know, uh, Hapring Group the API API uh, you know uh, API from Heparin API from uh, my my company in um, in fact is uh, considered as the very few API supply which is completely non um, contaminated so that's the company started to develop business and became the uh, exclusive supply of API for the US market and the, within the the years the company was very strong in the position of Heparin API so it was, uh, we have uh, both uh, manufacturing sites in US and in China. And the, the supply chain management of this API business starting from the raw material production and until right now extended to the in uh, inoxaparin, which is the finished dose uh, production. So the, the, the finished dose production is uh, produced in the Tecto group, the Tecto facility, so which is uh, the finished dose production. And in 2016, November, so there is the first European inoxaparin biosimilar launch in the Poland, which is called Neoprin. It's one of uh, a decentralized procedure licensed um, biosimilar of uh, inoxaparin. And then the second year, we got also an EMA approved uh, inoxaparin biosimilar uh, starting from September 2017. So in fact, in the portfolio of inoxaparin business in Europe, we have two brands. One is not Neoprin, and another one, another one is Inhisa. So the company, why they go to, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the finish those products, I think it's historic heritage legacy in the Heparin API business. So it's quite nature. So we get into a vert fully verticalized uh, biosimilar business. It's not uh, we invested afterwards. It's more from a legacy of Heparin API. And the company started in 2010, a diversification of long-term business growth. So we started investing in diff different you know, uh, aspects. So one is the extension of the full vertical supply chain of uh, the uh, heparin business. The second, we also invested in innovative drug development, CDMO business, uh, and also pancre uh, pancreatic uh, you know, enzyme API business. 
So the company is diversified and looking forward to the future growth through different uh, business units. So this is our uh, uh, vert, uh, the, 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 how to say, the, the journey of a company of an API to uh, a verticalized, uh, you know, a biosimilar uh, pro provider of the Indosaprine. And in, uh, in terms of our go-to-market strategy uh, worldwide, so it has a stepwise go-to-market strategy along the journey from, uh, you know, right in the beginning. In 2015, we start our business in China in terms of Indosaprine injectables. And at that time, we only produce as OEM, which means that we don't even own market authorization. We just do manufacturing with someone else, uh, uh, marketing authorization in the emerging markets around 10. So very small. So this is the uh, phase one development of our Indosaprine injectable business. And then the second phase, we go to European focus with uh, the two um, um, marketing authorization um, gained in the European market. So our business model, we have a diversified business model from self-commercialization with own affiliate setup. We have distribution and a supply agreement with partner or out license partnership agreement since 2016 uh, throughout the Europe. And then we start also focus on emerging market expansion because in several emerging market market, in fact, the price is much more interesting versus you know a European market. So we uh, we started this expansion in 2018 in the major growth potential emerging markets, mainly through out license and distribution, and a minor part is through OEM partnership. And we selected uh, local partners, you know, starting from 2018. And then we start the phase four US entry since 2020 with a partnership with a major US player uh, since 2020. So this is a short screenshot of uh, the different roadmap that we are uh, going to the market strategies, uh, you know, for our InnoZapron business. And as a, a verticalized, you know, biosimilar supplier that's both to our buyers or our, co uh, our customers and even our partners, there is a very, very key major key value proposition, not only that we propose to our partners, buyers and customers, but also really perceived uh, by our, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders is the security of supply, because this is quite important, especially in the inosaprine, you know, business, because the inosaprine was mainly from pork intestine, so it's a resource product. It basically, you know, linked to the number of porks, number of intestines that you can extract it. So, 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 so this is very quite important. So, uh, so Hyperlink, as I previously said, it's a truly verticalized heparin supply chain, uh, uh, you know, company from raw material. The raw material means that when we collect the pork intestine, we have our own facilities in China who can convert this pork intestine into the heparin crude. And then we also have API manufacturing, uh, a manufacturing site, convert the heparin crude raw material to heparin API. And then we have our techno, which is the finish and fuel facilitation to do a you know, separate finish and fuel in, in China. And in our US, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in US that we acquired a scientific protein laboratory uh, uh, in US. So we also have uh, API facilities in the US, both to uh, for sourcing and for producing production of API and crude. Uh, happen so that uh, for this is quite important in terms of uh, supply chain and also that we have you know within all these years we developed leading manufacturing technologies and know-hows so which can uh, you know additionally guarantee a high quality control standards for our uh, products so all these technologies which uh, you know secure that in terms of 
our production, we have a higher uh, um, um, biological identical, you know, versus the originator. While at the same time, we also uh, secure uh, the purification of the process. So this is, you know, perceived as high quality. And it's also worth mentioning that ourselves, not only we are as a bisimilar, you know, uh, of inosaprine, but we are also still maintained as a key API supplier for originator or other bisimilar uh, inosaprine as the API supplier or could supplier. And in, a, in addition that in, in China, we have a, a, a skilled production capacity Ability. So not only Finnish and few, so Finnish and few, we have 240 million uh, uh, state of the art, you know, high speed uh, feeling line, but we also have, you know, more than 50% of the, uh, you know, API production capacity worldwide to secure, uh, you know, Supreme API. So this can, you know, allow us as a verticalized, you know, in a Supreme um, player to meet high market demand. So if I can, uh, uh, you know, summarize uh, this uh, uh, features, uh, you know, for us. So it's more on the reliability, stability, and quality as a ver fully verticalized in those upper, um, player. So of course we have prongs and crones as a verticalized in those upper, by similar uh, player. So it's I call it a double-edged sword. So from a positive side. You see the supply security and the reliability and also you know because that we are a verticalized chain so it gives also very good risk resistance profile with respect to the price fluctuation and the shortage of raw material in the history of the api supply due to different reasons for example swing flu blue air uh, you know uh, diseases so in the api supply there is a uh, always, you know, the shortage and fluctuation of the API, you know, price, but being a verticalized, you know, a company, we are much more, you know, how to say flexible and also control the situation. So this gives us the pr pricing flexibility uh, very clearly is in the tender business model because if uh, you know that we 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 all know that in by similar business depending on a country you have uh, some are tender business some are promotion branded promotion but it's really depending uh, on the business award but we uh, that is very true with my experience in a tender business model we have a, a big advantage then our uh, short force is that uh, we need to have a high fixed affiliate sales operation cost because we are not presented previously. We are we are no nobody in, in Europe. The Chinese company no one know tech doll. So we have to if we do self uh, uh, commercialization, we have to set up affiliates. Uh, you have all this regulatory. So this is our all very high OPEX cost. And there and for the moment we have only one product, so there is no share of voice in terms of uh, OPEX sharing with other uh, you know, products or portfolio. And so this is quite challenging uh, in terms of profitability, especially in a branded uh, similar environment in certain kind of markets, which is purely branded by similar promotion market. So uh, while saying, you know, this pros and cons, that what I want to say is with our, my, with our experience that to be present and to be successful, in a by similar business, we need to be patient. Company need to be patient, and we need to be resilient. You know of this, you know, competitive environment, and company need to also be reasonable in terms of expectation on the profitability. So this is other key messages that I also want to share with you, uh, with more commercial perspective. So here I would like to also to share with you the framework of the thought process when defining our go-to-market strategy. Uh, so our go-to-market strategy is quite mixed, you know, for us. So we have out-licensing or we have OEM, we have self-commercialization or with a partnership. We have also in terms of partnership, we have risk sharing or with a bottom, uh, you know, uh, uh, a line transfer price model. And we also uh, thinking about, you know, uh, depending on markets, other, you know, more creative model, which is a mix of, you know, risk sharing, OEM, 
supply, you know, agreement. So, I mean, it's really depending on uh, a lot of factors. So, so during this, you know, thinking process, what are we, you know, look at it, you know, uh, all this. So we look at, you know, first, uh, we, we look at a regulatory environment. So in terms of regulatory environment, for example, do they need, uh, you know, uh, uh, will we go for our uh, uh, centralized procedure, you know, uh, marketing or serialization product or the Polish, you know, product, which is a decentralized product. So in terms of eye environment, what is the, you know, uh, uh, the minimum requirements for a, 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 a self-commercialized affiliate, uh, you know, setup? We also, uh, how to see, uh, uh, try to, evaluate our own appetite in terms of level of business control, understanding of market. So what we expected, you know, uh, you know, as the company want for this market. I also evaluate, you know, partners appetite if they are interested in licensing or if they just want to have, a, a, you know, a, a distribution uh, partnership and supply. Uh, are they, uh, you know, uh, willing to do risk sharing or they don't want me to control what they do and they only look for uh, you know, a, a transfer price. So these are the, the, the things I, I consider. And I also consider market architect. So is, is this a, a purely a brand promotion market or it's a very tender driven market? Because when it's very tender driven market, we think self commercializing will have advantage because we can keep our organization lean and the, you know, cost control versus big organization, you have huge, big cost. So we, we, we really look also the market architect and also in terms of pricing. So how they, you know, situated, you know, different channel pricing, if there is pricing is managed, you know, more, uh, you know, decided by payer in terms of sequence, if it's more decided, just retail free, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, regulated price, or in the hospital, they have another business model, which is a spillover model. So which means that you basically sell very low price in the hospital and expecting that you can have, you know, compensated in the retail market. So these are all the consideration also in the, in the, in the, in the decision on the go-to-market strategy. And also we need to see the entry barriers. So are we able to enter this market, you know, by ourselves, even with some, you know, service partner, or there are some certain kind of barriers that for me, it's not possible. For example, there are markets, the business, it's a substitution market. And so the retail channel is very important. And this retail channel is almost a kind of uh, a monopolized or, you know, shared by certain kind of players, which has, you know, uh, exclusive, uh, you know, partnership with individual pharmacies. So, so this kind of varies that, which means that you have to build your own road, which I, I don't think we can do. So these are also, you know, a kind of consideration that we are uh, looking at. And what is our expectation in terms of cash flow management? Are, uh, you know, are we looking, you know, for, uh, you know, quick cash flow, uh, uh, you know, collection, or we can sustain a big working capital, which has a big stock. So this is also divided, you know, driven by our uh, financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, and guidance, you know, from the uh, from our company. Uh, the, 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 in the end, I, I, I always need to do whatever the business model, I also need to build a business case to show my profitability. Uh, would I be profitability? Will, uh, will I be profitability uh, profitable or not? When? Can we uh, wait to that long? What are the other opportunities or alternatives to, to get it quicker? So these are also my business, you know, case, uh, you know, evaluation. If I do self, uh, you know, uh, commercialization, do we have the right local team? I mean, as a Chinese company without the name, having the right person, it's very challenging. I can tell you uh, when I set up my own affiliate. So, do we have the right local team? So it's also quite important. Some I, 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 I get the cases because that I just cannot find the, the right people. So I have to go for other business mod, model. And when I evaluate the partner capability, when you say, I would go for big pharma, I we go for generic partner, I we go for local, you know, small partnership. So, you know, me, I'm more, uh, you know, un, uh, evaluate not on the general capability, 
uh, capability of the partner, but is looking at in this market, what are partners a capability, what they can bring to me. So I do, you know, quite, you know, uh, uh, detailed analysis in capability, uh, uh, you know, analyze. So, so my model is not go for a big partner for whole region. I was more go for different markets, different partner. I could have go to different markets with one partner, but I don't go for general, you know, um, partnership. So this is, you know, uh, uh, presented as the framework of thought process when I am uh, doing uh, uh, selecting go to market strategies. And so now that, that I would like to show you that, uh, you know, what our performance. So four years after first launch in Poland with our new print. So currently, uh, Tectos in Osaprin, uh, in Oxaprin business uh, by similar has built a quite solid foot in key European markets in 2020, regardless of any challenges that we may have encountered. So if you look at UK, we have 27% retail market and 53% hospital market. And Poland, 65 retail market, Italy, 13% retail market, Austria, Austria reached the 34% of retail market. So these are our different, you know, models. UK, Poland, Italy, we have self commercialization. Austria, we are partnership. So uh, if I look, you know, within starting from 2015, so we are coming from a 10 OEM markets to right now, uh, represented in more than 10 major European markets and more than 50 international markets either through commercialization by ourselves uh, or by partnership. And these are the 50 uh, markets, uh, uh, you know, uh, ongoing including ongoing registration uh, in, U in, in US and in, in the emerging markets. So these are uh, the current performance, key performance in our European market. So if you ask me what's uh, my, uh, uh, you know, learnings, you know, that um, I want to share with, you know, people participating in this session. In fact, I want to go, still go to uh, the people part, you know, uh, aside from all these commercial, you know, uh, things. In fact, you know, as a Chinese company to get, you know, uh, commercialized uh, the co uh, products in the European market, it's really challenging. And the most challenging thing is to get into two cultures together. And getting the two cultures together, you know, before I, I really work uh, for, for, for this, you know, um, product, I don't really, you know, feel like that importance and that, uh, you know, uh, uh, critical. And when I work on this, you know, uh, 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 and product and with my own experience, I really find, you know, it's not only on the paper, it's really truly, you know, how to align, you know, this mindset together, the Chinese mindset, our European partner, customer, and the different, you know, organization, my own affiliates, get people aligned in terms of understanding how we do in business, how we do partner together is the most important thing. So I said, getting the mindset right will be the half of the battle. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was playing the role basically is really to try to let Chinese understand how European thinking, how European uh, look at things. And I need to also uh, make our uh, partner, our customer to understand, you know, different perspectives that Chinese co company bring to this business. So, you know, that, this uh, different culture uh, from, you know, Northern dominated linear active culture uh, into all this Latin culture of Southern European and then go to the Asia, very reactive, pragmatic, you know, uh, stress facing and it, 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 it's, it's quite interesting. So I, I, I want to, you know, uh, stress on this part uh, of the importance, you know, within my uh, presentation. So, so uh, my last slide is to show you that our journey still continues. There is still a lot to learn, learn from others and learn from, you know, by similar business. Uh, that's my presentation. Thank you, Anne. And it's interesting to see the, the journey from, uh, you know, the Noxaparine journey in, with, with your company. Um, I think now we move fast into uh, the, the, the presentation from uh, Jean-Baptiste. So Jean-Baptiste, if you can uh, share your screen, it would be great. Thank you. Okay, short, short introduction promise to um, about Enius because uh, you understand this is a Chinese quarter now. 
Um, Enius is one of the leading biotech company uh, appearing uh, the last 10 years. So in fact, we are still a teenager. We are, we are 10 years old. So we are a fully verticalized uh, company, which means we develop from the cell line to the finish, uh, to the finished product. So we do everything from all sides. So we develop the cell line uh, in California and in Shanghai. We do the preclinical uh, in Taipei, all internal. And then we, we run phase one and phase three with the biggest CRO, because as you know, when you are new in this business, you have to work with big CRO to, to get some awareness when you will discuss after that to, to your main agency. So we have a mixed model. Uh, we are very close, in fact, to map science, for example. I know Eduardo is attending also uh, Pharma Synergy. So it means we are very strong on our domestic market. We are not a pure CDMO like, uh, like Anil with uh, Adalvo Alvotech, but we are using our capacity also to out-license our product. Just to give you an overview, for example, our first plant, uh, we have 20,000 liters capacity. And our new plant uh, opening this year, we have uh, 24,000 liters capacity. So in terms of, uh, in terms of industrial capacity, it's, uh, it's quite, quite impressive, in fact. Uh, here, this is just a snapshot uh, of, uh, of a new portfolio, just to, to one more time to make echo to the annual presentation. This portfolio is quite balanced, in fact, between biosimilar product, bio beta product, and bio-innovative product. And in fact, this is probably one of the key success uh, for the future because it will be very complicated as we will speak later to, to be only a bio, pure biosimilar uh, company. Here, this is a very, very short, short introduction because uh, I will go very quickly on this slide. So at Enius, we have a chance to be uh, very global. So in fact, we can discuss with any country. Today, I discussed, for example, with Guatemala, Kazakhstan and uh, Bangladesh, for example. So this gives us a very, very good understanding of uh, all, all, uh, all market, uh, all patient pathway, all pricing. And this make, this make one more time echo to what Marco said in introduction. In fact, the main message is that everybody at the end knows who are the players in monoclonal antibody and more, and more or less who everybody knows the pricing. So in fact, the price trend is very, very well known now. When you discuss five years ago with some partner, sometimes you receive the forecast and the pricing assumption and the, basically the, the price uh, proposed by the partner was only a small erosion of one, two, three percent per year. And now for, since uh, Gopal uh, with Lupin or, uh, or Biocon or Dr. Eddy's on, on the market, uh, the price erosion is much more faster. And in fact, we saw the price cut uh, much, much going faster. And, uh, this has a nudge impact. And now when we receive a forecast from, from our possible partner, it's, uh, it's very common now to have 10 to 20% price cut every year, in fact. So this is how we divide uh, the, um, the world from our side. Uh, we, it's a very good point. And this one more time, it's very important to notice that, in fact, we are talking about biosimilar in any part of the world. So uh, interchangeability switch, uh, there is no problem anymore. Uh, I will nevertheless highlight one point because I think it's important because at, at the end there is always patient on this slide. And uh, in fact, this is the global market. Africa still need uh, biosimilar product. Africa, we do not find so many products available for now. I think for one reason, which is Roche who didn't invest so much in Africa in the past. And in fact, the African business still need to be developed. And uh, this is one of the probably one of the main markets where we, we could find some interesting growth in the future. The slide six uh, is a very sm small snapshot about uh, the EU situation, which is, you, as you know, the most competitive market in the world. There is one interesting change when you watch the profile of uh, players in biosimilar business. Initially, you found very small classical big pharma and biotech company like Roche, like Amgen or Pfizer. And now we can see some pure generic player uh, on this business, uh, Viatris, uh, Sandoz, Tiva, from all side or partner at the Helios Accord. So I think it's very important because in fact, it gives really the color of the market and the color of the market is no generic markets. There is no, nothing, or nothing else. In fact, this is a price battle. So you can get the, the, the nicest tender pack. In fact, at the end, it's really, really, 
a price a price battle. So this has uh, some consequences, obviously. So um, obviously, manufacturer must propose low price and get a very very flexible supply chain to be able to reply to each tender and deliver time in in due time the product. Uh, we usually said that for a commercial company, it's reasonable for biologic product to have two to four months uh, inventory stock, uh, because obviously stock is money. But at the end, when you, for, sure, for example, you win tenders in France or Germany, which are the biggest tenders for my monoclonal antibody, then uh, if you win the tender, you have no stock anymore. So it's very, very important to have a very well balanced and very trust uh, flexibility uh, with your manufacturer, or you can you could be very, very, very easily when you win big tenders uh, in shortage. So uh, price from manufacturer obviously shall decrease faster uh, than price uh, cut with all the tender or basically you, you lose margin. Um, also, we discussed already uh, this part, but uh, we saw that uh, for the pure commercial uh, partner, in fact, uh, they used to to, to have, let's say, 20 to 30% OPEX uh, in the past. We know, obviously, that it's not the case anymore. And now they have to really, really uh, manage their OPEX. And uh, it's not rare anymore, even in Europe, to have 10 to 15% maximum OPEX to try to, uh, to, to stay profitable. So uh, very, very short uh, conclusion, I think. Uh, in fact, there is no miracle solution in this uh, biosimilar and biologic, uh, biologic area. In fact, there is some mistake we have absolutely to avoid. And I think there is one interesting thing when I read all the time the press release from Anil, from Alvotech uh, at, at Alvo, in fact, uh, when, you, when you see some press release from this company, they usually sign multiple product deal. It means it's not one deal with one product, and in fact, this is one of the key success, definitely, because if you sign one product with one partner, and this is the first biosimilar of a partner, you will basically will do uh, no, no volumes. And in fact, the curve from Marco won't be uh, three years uh, increasing. It will be one year, and then they will disappear. Because with one product, you cannot, you cannot be uh, successful, for sure. Um, so in fact, uh, it's very, very important for a partner uh, to manage everything. Uh, so to be as as much as possible uh, vertically integral uh, to, and to avoid this price battle. In fact, we, we discussed already in the past, but it's very important to have a trust partner for the supply chain to propose life cycle with innovative dosage or innovative form or innovative combination. Innovative combination, for example, is what we are doing at Helios, meaning we develop a Befacizumab uh, mono, uh, biosimilar, but we have also innovative PD-1. And then we can combine both and in fact combine both developments. So in this case, it's much more interesting in terms of product development and allocation of your development cost. Uh, it's obviously very, very important to work on process optimization because uh, I think for now, uh, everybody's working on single use technology. I guess in two or three years, everybody will work on continuous, uh, continuous uh, process. So it means uh, probably price cut from two to five, which is obviously very, very interesting. Everybody, and especially from all side, from uh, let's say manufacturer, uh, manufacturer perspective, we have to focus also on smaller biologic product uh, or new indication. Uh, for example, we sign from all side, but um, I think it's smart approach, but we saw a lot of uh, example like that. We sign uh, obviously a Befacizumab, in new indication in WAMD. And uh, the last point is obviously, and this is what we try to do at NUS to have a balanced pipeline between bio better and bio innovative. And uh, some company could stay in this business, especially for example, uh, Amgen, uh, only if they have a bio innovative product because biosimilar is not profitable anymore so for them. So they will probably leave this market if they are not able to have bio-innovative product who can balance the, the, the lack of profitability on the biosimilar business. And that's all for my... Thank, thanks a lot, Jean-Baptiste. And I think I cannot agree more. I mean, everything that you shared is a very, very nice summary in a few slides of what the, the world of biosimilars look like. I'm, I'm very much in agreement. And um, and, and I think it, it was a good, uh, a good uh, review or 
Capital have a good, very good comment on the price erosion and how it's changing lately uh, with the biosimilars and how we're seeing a, the price going down much faster. And uh, we're only in a way protected in terms of price when we play more in the retail space. Um, and, uh, and probably even in the retail space uh, in countries such as Germany, you end up having such, a, such high discounts that need to be given that at the end, uh, you're not profitable or lowly, low profitability, but you still have low profitability. So you need to be careful and you need to play a lot with, uh, with the cost of goods. Uh, um, so maybe uh, now if we go into the, the Q&A session, I, I'll uh, quickly start with uh, uh, actually a couple of questions I, I've, I've noted down and then I'll go on with, uh, uh, with questions from, from the audience. Um, first one, very quick one for, for you, Jean-Baptiste, since, you, since you've just uh, here with your presentation. And it's you, you mentioned that um, some players are trying to get an approval or maybe trying to get an approval in Europe just to open up other markets and then maybe play in the Middle East and Africa, Latam, APAC region. So, and there you see uh, slightly better prices. Um, how long will these last? First, first of all, and given the fact that usually these are smaller markets, does it still make sense to use an approach like this one? Yes, it's definitely true. In fact, uh, we'll give you an example we are living for now uh, at Endius. When you file uh, a centralized procedure, it's basically just a license fees around 300,000 euros. But these 300,000 euros, in fact, give you access to shortcuts to some company and it's not only regulatory uh, shortcut and winning gaining sometimes it's also in terms of pricing this morning we discussed with uh, with Anvisa in brazil and uh, afra in south africa and what they get they ask us they ask us the listed price so in fact you can register your maps in europe getting a fast track in this part of some country and then giving them the listed price. And we know this is price has no meaning for now, but at least I will provide the listed price of Trastuzumab, for example, in Brazil. And, that, and uh, uh, it will probably give me at least 18 months uh, shortcut, the same for South Africa, and at least a very good listed price. So in fact, it's really a danger uh, and it could, it, yes, it could be uh, at least uh, one, two, in one or two, in one or two years, I think some company will start to do like that. Probably, probably because three thousand euros is just nothing, and uh, yeah. and uh, and unfortunately, uh, the competition is too hard in monoclonal antibody at least in Europe. So, uh, so uh, from my side in Athenius, uh, Europe is the, the worst profitability area uh, in all the world. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, good. Thank you. So, if I if I look at the questions that are coming in, so there is one from Johan Koch. Um, he's asking uh, Gopal uh, if you could please give us again your opinion about the actual status and how relevant is considered in the development of biosimilars inter interchangeability studies that guarantee effectiveness and safety for switching, considering that it may be one of the main hurdles adopted by many MOH around the world. Is an important way for differentiation. Is it uh, an important way for differentiation in the future? So I think, uh, uh, Joanne, a very uh, in interesting question and with the way things are at this point. Uh, in, in Let me start with Japan. In Japan, there's absolutely nothing called interchangeability because you, I don't know if you know the, the way the biosimilars are approved is biosimilar one, biosimilar two. And they just go on, you know, as in more biosimilars come in. So they're openly interchanging between the innovator and the, the biosimilars. And it's purely driven by the NHI or the insurance price and what benefits uh, that can carry. Moving to Europe, I think it's pretty much everybody is switching purely tender driven, again, price driven. Uh, the data with also more biosimilars already approved in the market. I think uh, with many countries, it's already going that way where there's free switchability already happening. Now coming to the US, I think, uh, yes, there is uh, there are markets like Australia, Canada, a flag rating and those kind of things. But in the US, what's happening is you have to enter a, 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 
the new patients or new new uh, product. Uh, I would say looking at only new patients first, and then interchangeability will be a good differentiation for companies who want to enter the U.S. market. But it also comes at a cost, and it is a company strategy to decide whether this investment into the interchangeability study will actually benefit them to get a price advantage or it's only a volume game because if it's only a volume game then really it, it it comes down to how much you can produce and how much you can actually sell and what price you're selling at right uh, but if it is really going to benefit them to give it at the same price as the innovator or even a little lesser but above the other biosimilar players who don't have an interchangeability study then it's worth it but in the long run i think the us will also go the eu way where there's going to be free switchability and it again depends on how many players are in the market and whether it really makes uh, commercial sense to the player Thanks, Gopal. Any any other um, comment from the rest of, uh, of the panel? I think Marco, in for interchangeability and switch, uh, it won't have from my side so much value because in fact now the challenge is more to is no more to switch from biosimilar to biosimilar. It's not switching from the or originator to uh, to biosimilar. So in fact, the study is a bit different. In fact, so. Uh, it, I will have. I will see, for example, much more value to to have a extensive, for example, in use stability or something to add very, very, very tangible value for uh, for the prescriber. But interchangeability now it's a, it's a common business. Yeah. Well, well, and I think just sorry, Marco. One more point that I just want to add is I think you would rather spend that money on getting another product in your pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> than you yeah. know uh, on interchange. Yeah. I think that the real trend that we're in the market with the uh, with the different uh, in the different markets is more sub automatic substitution or full substitution. We feel biosimilar and biosimilar. You see that in uh, in France potentially coming, although it was rejected at first. Potentially in in Germany. The only the only point there is that uh, we need to evolve. I mean, the companies that have biosimilar products need to evolve or strike partnership to have a, a presence from uh, the pharmacy level. Because that's where the substitution really happened, um, and uh, and so there's a that potentially who, who wants to have somewhat of a uh, life policy uh, and uh, or insurance policy should have should be ready to in case of, of substitution uh, uh, be ready to to change their sales force in order to call onto 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 pharmacies or have a partner that can do that. So um, now going going on, maybe I have another question uh, for for you, Gopal, actually about uh, the second wave. You said that uh, also second wave is a is a. I mean, there's life stuff. Uh, there's life uh, beyond the first wave, and uh, you can still make uh, uh, profitability. You can still work and and launch uh, biosimilars as a second wave. And and I guess you need to be a little bit more creative. Can you share uh, some more of your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, when it comes to biosimilars, uh, one of the key aspects is also uh, the approvability by Ministry of various health authorities on each segment, like oncology, biosimilars, the approval uh, is a little bit more stricter, I would say, more evaluation goes into that. Then you move to the arthritis or the, you know, the, the a second, uh, I would say, category of molecules. And then you have these molecules which are slightly older, uh, the first generation of biosimilars. And, but in terms of coming second to the party, I think you understand what is the market scenario from a pricing perspective. You understand what kind of devices the earlier biosimilar players have, uh, have in their portfolio. And it also clearly uh, lists down what are the ways in which in the US they are working with, which kind of model are they working with? Are they going uh, to more of the insurance players? Are they going to uh, PBMs directly? Are they going to distributors directly? And where is the opportunity? Because the, the critical aspect is 
having a portfolio of medicines, not only biosimilars, but other medicines also, then you go with a package to a, 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 a large distributor or a company like uh, ABC or somebody like that. And then you sell this whole portfolio. So for them, it's a big revenue coming from one single custom. And these are some of the ways in which you can really tap into, even though being a second player in the market. Uh, when it comes to Europe, I think it also becomes very important uh, in, in terms of, I know the initial ramp up on the pricing will be much, much higher if you're in the first wave. But I think this market kind of consolidates by the time the second player or the third player enters. And then you clearly know where you are able to enter, what pricing to enter. And then it, it, it's not a flexible approach uh, where you, know, you enter, okay, this is not doing well. The innovator also drops the price. Okay, we'll also drop the price. But it kind of stabilizes when you enter into the second or the third. And what we feel is also- I, I, I guess that, yeah, it, it may, makes sense. And thank you for, for, for your answer. I think I think that also another I mean the key point there when you go into the, as a second wave again of course you know now the market and you can can uh, take advantage of that of that knowledge but at the end I I believe that you cannot really tackle the second wave well if you're not able to really have control ownership of the price and the cost of goods I mean uh, in terms of cost of goods when I'm looking at at biosimilars and thinking about what is it going to be in three four years time. I need to make sure that the cost of goods are usually no more than 5% of the originator price. So whatever was the originator price before the new biosimilar step in, I need to be able to think about, okay, in three, four, five year time, my cost of goods will have to be under 10 to 10 or even 5% of what was the originator price. Of course. And also the other aspect, Marco, is how much as a company are you willing to uh, look at molecule profitability in the sense, are you, how much, how happy are you? Are you yeah. happy on 80% profitability all the time? Or are you looking at 20%, 30% and happy with that? And it comes with the fact that are you an innovator player entering into biosimilars or are you a generic player entering into biosimilars? And mm -hmm. that is going to make the difference because for companies like us, where we are in India, we also look at profitability, but our understanding of profitability is very different from anybody else in, in other parts of the world, or especially from the US and Europe. So, All right, so I think we've finished our time for, the, for, for this session. Uh, there are no further open questions. So again, thanks everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks to the people that attended.